thank you for joining us this morning, uh, those by watching my way of Facebook and YouTube, uh, to our Sunday school at Fort Baptist Church here in Portsmouth, Virginia. Uh, today's lesson, the title of today's lesson is Counting All Things Lost. And the scripture reference is coming from uh, Philippians 3, 7 through 21. And without further ado, we're just going to open up in gospel order. We're going to pray, and uh, instead of reading all of the scriptures at one time, we are going to read them uh, as we go through the lesson. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We give you the glory and honor and praise among us. Oh, well, God, we're just so ever grateful for what you've done in our lives. God, thank you for bringing us through another year thus far, God. Christmas is on the, on the horizon, Lord God, in a couple of weeks. And so, God, we understand and know that it's not about the gifts that we receive, but it's about you. And so, God, help us to learn more and study about you today in this session. And God, bless us by being with us right now. God, we ask your name, in Jesus' name. We ask all these things, your son, Jesus' name, let us all say. Amen. Well, I wish those who were uh, watching my web Facebook could see my PowerPoint slide, but those who are in the room can't. Uh, what you see here on the slide is a example of uh, a picture of a trash, or what we call landfill in Virginia. Uh, Mount Transmore, we all uh, are, are uh, familiar with Mount Transmore and Virginia Beach. But uh, there's some other landfills that we have uh, around here. But counting things, counting all things lost, I see that this is a very good photo in reference to that. Just a landfill, a bunch of trash. And for most of you, whatever Bible reference you're using, whether it's New King James or King James Version, um, we want to get down to verse 8 where Paul actually says, use the word dumb. If you have the King James Version, he will use that word dumb, which is in Greek, the Greek word is skubalon, which means rubbish. If you have a new King James Version, it's translated to rubbish. Or excrement. Okay? Or worthless. Okay? So that's why we use the trash because when we don't, when something is damaged, which loss, the Greek word is zemea, which means damaged. When we don't want it, want things, and it's broken, damaged, we toss it out. It serves us no value anymore, so it's lost. So we throw it right there, we count it as lost. It's worthless, it's a street mint, it's rubbish, it's trash. So this picture is in his previous life before Christ. He no longer saw the credentials he has earned, no longer any value, because of Christ. He has placed those things behind him. Paul commended the Philippians for many good aspects of their lives, but in this letter, his letter, he has challenged them to press on to become the best that they could be for Christ. Rather than being complacent where they were, they needed to set their eyes higher or set their sights higher. Christians can reach their potential for Christ only by striving or giving it their best. So their wholehearted effort needs to be given to what is truly excellent. So striving for excellence, however, comes at a high price. Oh yeah, it comes with a high price. It takes exertion to attain what God desires. So as Paul himself learned, he means reaching forward rather than settling for past successes and pressing upward instead of living for the world. It means looking in the expectation for the return of Christ. Okay? So now, the author of our lesson gave us three learning objectives. Striving for excellence, which is covered in 7 through 11, verses 7 through 11. Striving with exertion, which is covered in verses 12 through 16. 
and then strive in expectation, which is 17 through 21. And we want to read those as we go along, because time will allow me to read every scripture um, at one time. So it's better to do some expository uh, um, as we read each scripture and break it down. All right, so let's read verses 7 through 11. I will read these verses, and then the next go around, we'll get someone else to read the next one. Verse 7. For what things we gain were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. Yet indeed I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ, Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and counted and, and count them as rubbish, that I may obtain, that I may gain and be found in him. Not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being confronted, excuse me, being conformed to his death. If by any means I am attained to the resurrection from the dead. The author, in regards to striving for excellence, the author gave us three, three views of this. Finding true gain, finding true righteousness, and finding true intimacy. Well, before Paul, before his salvation, Paul's life marked by credentials, as I mentioned earlier. He had credentials of many kinds, many kinds. He achieved at the highest level of every significant category of his life, majority of his life. He was a Jew, really, and he also learned Greek. Okay, so he was very knowledgeable. He was in these circles, and he had a lot of credentials. He could speak Stoic, and he could... He was around those, uh, the Aristotle and Plato and all of those great minds. Um, he was around. So Paul could be, he could have been proud of his achievements, but he realized in God's kingdom, they were worth nothing. And some stood in the way of Paul's surrender, of Paul's surrender to Christ. Um, Paul compared all that he had achieved by his own efforts of what Christ could accomplish in and through him. Um, as Paul viewed his life from the perspective of God's values, he decided to give up all things for which he had lived. So we also have to understand, too, that Paul, his credentials that he had and he was doing, it wasn't for the good. He thought it was for the good until he ran to Christ. Uh, he was killing Christians, as what we as we, we what we remember, and I do, and I am reminded of the scripture where he said, "Listen, I'm going. I went to God three times. Went to God three times, requesting Him to, because this buffet, this this a, a messenger from Satan keeps keeps attacking me. Why does he keep attacking Paul? Because what he used to do, right? His credentials led him into a place where he was killing Christians." Um, until he met Christ on the way to Damascus. Okay? He gave them all up just for Christ. When he met Christ, as Reverend Thomas has preached last Sunday, he was a game changer. Christ was the game changer to Paul. And it changed, changed his life. And this is why he's given up his own credentials for Christ. As Paul came to realize personal assets can easily become spiritual liabilities if they blind us to the ultimate value of knowing Christ. So instead of living for his own pride, uh, for the applause of others, Paul could choose to focus his life on a truly excellent goal of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, his Lord. This has really truly reminded me really actually encouraged me to continue to press forward. It's tough uh, trying to 
balance school and work and a family. Uh, I decided, the Lord placed on my heart to go to school to learn of God, to learn God. Uh, it's not just only to get an MBA, which is the prize at the end that I will receive, but the ultimate goal here in getting is to get to know Christ. Chasing after Christ and getting to know Him. So all things that had dominated Paul's life before will only hinder him from knowing Christ. They got in his way. Did y'all still see the PowerPoint? Oh, I'm sorry. Did y'all still see it? Paul, therefore, regarded them as dumb. As I mentioned earlier, it was a picture up there for those who just walked in. Uh, it was a picture of a landfill which is trash. So the Greek terminology for that, dumb, is excrement, which means trash or rubbish, right? And it's also worthless. So that's how Paul viewed his credentials in his life. He viewed them as garbage. Okay? Therefore, he regarded them as dumb, totally unworthy, knowing Christ made every other goal look like garbage. Now, this, is, this lesson is rather simple. There's no deep dive into this lesson uh, about uh, really like a real theological, right? Uh, there is still uh, um, theological concepts installed here. However, it's just a reminder to all of us to keep striving forward for Christ. Amen? Amen. So as Paul, as Paul is our example of what that looks like, that's what we're looking at today is we examining how Paul viewed his mindset of moving forward in Christ and that we should adopt that same mindset. The only way a person can view life from this perspective is to see how valuable Christ is. So we have to see how valuable God is, how Christ is valuable to us. That is finding true gain. That's what Paul meant. In verse 7 through 8, when he meant it, listen, I count all things done, but this Christ is my new game. That is my true game here. Not my credentials, not my degrees, not my certifications, but Christ is my true game. That's what it says. But finding true righteousness, verse 9. Can I get a volunteer to read verse? Now, actually, I already read it. I'll read it again for those who just came here. <laughs> Verse 9 says, And be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. Paul prided himself on knowing the law of Moses, because that's what he did. He was a, a, he was a born a Jew, but he lived in the Greek, but he knew all of the law. And saw himself as a blameless, as, as blameless regarding righteousness. Because, like I said, he had the credentials. He had the credentials. He was living like, oh, well, I'm blameless. You guys are not following the law. So therefore, that time is coming. I'm coming knocking on your door. And we, we got some reckoning to do. That's Paul. But that's, that's, that was his attitude in the past. That's how he was killing Christians. Right? Now, being in Christ, now after being in Christ, he realized that trying to acquire his own righteousness through obedience to the law was futile or futile. None was true righteousness. True righteousness comes from God through faith in Christ Jesus. Righteousness is not earned by keeping the law for sinful Simple for humans are unable to fulfill God's righteousness or righteous demands. Instead, Christ's perfect righteousness is imputed to those who accept him by faith as saved. Matter of fact, uh, I'm, thank you, Holy Spirit. There is a, that just reminded me of how Abraham's faith counted him as righteous because of his faith. Now, there's three terms in theology, right? I'm theoretical. Here we go. I say there were some theological concepts. Here it comes. There's three terms in regards to soteriology that we learn in the doctrine of salvation. One is justification. The other one is sanctification. And then the third is glorification. Okay? 
Now, we're just going to take the other two off because those two are glorification is the final process of when we become, when we get our new body, we're glorified before God. Sanctification is an everyday continual process. We're being sanctified as we live for Christ today. But justification is the first step. Justification and a bumper sticker and just giving you the understanding of that, what that means, giving you a bumper sticker is, is when God declares us righteous. There's nothing that we could do to be righteous. We can't be righteous by following the law. Now that Christ has died for remission of our sins, he, once we place our faith in him, God's saying, okay, since you believe in my son Jesus Christ, I declare you righteous. There's nothing that we have to do to earn it but just believing in Jesus Christ. That's why he said, that's why that last statement that was made was that faith, right, true, right, true righteousness comes from God through faith in Christ. Right? But that's what justification is. God declares us righteous when we place our faith in Christ Jesus. So the key to Christian life is not living, it's not us living it by Christ. No, it's, excuse me, the, the key to Christian life is not us living it, but Christ living through us. Did we, we get that? Did I confuse y'all with that? No? Okay. All right. Let's look at, let your light shine. Yes. Let your light shine. Correct. Correct. So Christ living through us, that's what the, that's what the whole game is. Because guess what? When, when we're living in the dispensation of the Holy Spirit, where the Holy Spirit lives in us, he, 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 there's like eight things that the Holy Spirit do for us. He brings all things to our remembrance. He guides us into all truth. Um, he shows us things to come. Actually, they were the things that um, Jesus told the disciples that when the Comforter comes, he's going to do these things. And so, today, I believe God is, through the Holy Spirit, He's still doing this. And so, if we allow the Holy Spirit to live through us and do that, that's exactly what He did. So, we have to allow Christ to be lived, allow God to live through us. Amen? Amen. Amen. I, I had a thought here. Um, when, when, we, when we use the word... I had a thought that came to mind where uh, when we're talking about Christ living through us, uh, <clears throat> Peter had mentioned in 1 Peter 3, 7, he said, husbands likewise dwell with them, dwell with, dwell with them with understanding, giving honor to the wife as the weaker vessel and as being heirs together of grace, of the grace of life that your prayers may not be hindered. Now, I may be stepping on the land, man, when I'm talking about this, but this is scripture. Okay? The A part of this verse is, husbands likewise dwell with the wife with understanding. Now, dwell, we translate that to live. And to live with our wife, now first, for those who are watching, it's not boyfriend live with girlfriend, live with them for understanding. It's a husband's. Right? So I want to make sure that that's what marriage is talking about. So I'm not trying to encourage anyone to be shacking up, okay? <laughs> All right, so husbands dwell, live with them for understanding. I have to live with my wife to understand her, right? To understand her, I have to live with her, dwell with her. Now, that had to take some time. It's still taking time. Learning her, learning her habits and things, and understanding how, what makes her tick. Right? And giving honor to her as she's the weaker vessel, so that my prayers may not be hindered. Now, I'm not just saying that because she ain't here. Right? Uh, she has heard this said before. Okay? So I have to understand and learn her. And that's what we have to do with God. We have to live, allow God to live through us so that we can understand and know Him. See my point there? So we have to understand and know God uh, by, by living and allowing him to live through us. Spending time will create some intimacy, 
with God. So intimacy is, uh, is it, it comes with a price. Intimacy comes with a price. And living with God, hey, we, we, there's some things that we're going to have to do that we might not like to do. And God will tell us to do some stuff. So that comes to it. So I wanted to share that because, because we will, once we gain a relationship with God, that intimacy with God will, will be there. And it's not always sexual. When I'm talking about the wife, the husband and wife, it's not just spending time with them to understand who they are or, or one another. And that grows a closeness with one another when it comes to intimacy. Amen? Amen. Amen. Any questions about finding true intimacy? Finding true righteousness or finding true gain? Okay. Striving with exertion. Philippians 12 through 16. And the, the author gives us uh, three, three points about that. Reaching forward, pressing upward, and walking onward. A lot of us already know this because when we encourage our, we have, we have um, children who are going to college or and things, and it gets tough, right? Once it gets tough, um, they we're, our natural instinct as humans is to to give up, to let it go. Nah, nah you know what? I, I'm not going to do this, man. I'm, this is just tough. But at the, you, you're so close. Matter of fact, I said that. I'm really close to the end of my master's degree right now, and I'm like, man, I'm about, uh, I'm about ready to let this thing go. However, I got to push on. And striving with exertion, um, it, there's some mental exertion that comes with studying and knowing God. Right? So there's going to be some mental, some physical, some emotional exertion when we're striving for God. So we want this. Paul is, is giving us and encouraging us as well as the Philippians. He's encouraging us to strive forward. But there's going to be some exertion. Verse 12, pressing toward the goal. Not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of, of that which for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Verse 13, brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. So reaching forward, for Paul, to know God intimately, he had to reach toward the goal. He had to leave his credentials behind and say, Christ is the game changer, so let me learn of him because now he is my new goal. Okay? The closer he drew to God, the more he realized his own sinfulness. That's what happens when we become intimate with God. He starts revealing some stuff to us as we gain closer to him. He was not willing to settle for the complacent status of the spiritual underachievement. He wasn't. Paul is an example of pressing forward, pressing through. He was that guy. He has really actually wrote at least 13, well, yeah, he has wrote if you count Hebrews as Paul being the author, that's 13 letters of the New Testament that Paul has wrote. Oh, yeah, he was, Paul was a bad man. Very, very intelligent. And he pressed forward in any situation that he was in. He refused to look back in the rearview mirror of life to all his supposed credentials before he was saved. Nor did he let guilt and regrets for past actions shackle him and impede his spiritual process. How many of us today is allowing our past to hinder us from reaching our goal in Christ? You don't have to share anything. Okay, <laughs> that was just a question, just a rhetorical question for you to, to take inventory within yourself to say, hey, 
Am I allowing my past to really stop me from moving forward in God? Is something, is there a wall there that's stopping me from breaking through to get to God? What is it? Is it trauma? Is it something that happened in your childhood? Is it something that may have happened on the job? That you just take that inventory for yourself. But he didn't allow that. And so since he didn't allow it, and since he's encouraging the Philippians to not allow it, we can take this today to tell ourselves, like, no, we shouldn't allow our past to hinder us from getting it done. Any questions, comments about reaching forward before we go to pressing upward? Anybody got anything to share? Any thoughts? I ask that because I've been doing a lot of talking myself right now, so I want to give you guys a chance to say something. Yeah, this, is a, this is a good lesson for someone who, um, you know, many people accept Christ and they accept Christ, they need to understand that they continue, they need to, continue to learn and study. Yeah. You know, it's like we were talking about in the of intimacy. Yeah. You know, getting to know Christ. You know, when you come down and accept Him, yeah. and many people I talk to when they come back and accept for the first time, yeah. and I tell this like a relationship, you know, when he comes to Bible study in Sunday school, and, um, you know, church service, you yeah. know, get, get a better understanding, yeah. you know, don't just come down and say, say yeah. you know, you got to work on that relationship, because you just, you know, accept the relationship with Christ, oh, yeah. so it's like any other relationship, you know, yeah. you got to get the Lord first, yeah. Thank you for that, for, for that piece that just like any other relationship, you got to work at it. And, so, and, and I used to tell folks, I said, man, just because you say and you had a bad relationship with a, a family member, you got to go back and fix that. Yeah, that's right. Just because you say it don't make it everything all right. That's right. Um, you got to go back and work on that relationship with that person that you messed up with because they still walking around holding on to some stuff, holding on to some baggage that which is something maybe you may have said something, or not you, but the person may have said something to them or what have you, or may have done something to them, but then they just said, well, now I'm saved, so you should give me a pass. No, uh, no, 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 no. I can't just need your pass. We got we to gotta talk some things out. I need some closure, right? The person needs some closure there, and you have to work on that relationship. Right? And the same thing, I think it been um, Hayes, or well, Deacon Hayes, for well, saying that, uh, we have to work on our relationship with others and also with God. I always say it. When God, when the Ten Commandments, the first four was how we should approach God and how we should treat God. And the last six is pertaining to how we should treat each other. So Jesus put, put them all together and gave them a bumper sticker. Love the Lord with all your heart. Mind and soul. He said the second commandment is just like it, but greater. Love your neighbor as yourself. So we can follow those two, or we'll follow that commandment there. We're good. But it's going to take some work, and we're going to get exerted. But some folks going to get on our nerves when we try to do this. Amen. So they're going to get on our nerves. But we got to press through. We got to reach forward. We got to remember Christ is the game, and we got to work through that. Amen. Any any other comments? Okay. I speed steps now. Press it upward. Paul toward Paul would push toward or pursue the mark, knowing Christ and being like him. That was his goal. To be like him and to pursue him. He has a holy discontent that keeps him pressing on. There's just something. He just couldn't be still, man. I got to keep pressing on. I, I just can't. Uh, this, this thing inside of me just keep turning. I got to keep moving. He has not. He was not distracted by the crowd. Well, let me take that back. The slide here shows a picture of those crossing the finish line on the track. Now we know, depending on what type of race you run, there's some hurdles or what have you. And you have to stay in your lane in the track when you're running track, right? Um, to get to that mark, you have to be focused. 
You can't you can't swerve in somebody else's lane. You got to stay in that that person to stay in their lane, right? That finish line was the goal for the runner. So like the runner, they're not distracted by the crowd. He didn't prepare himself. Paul didn't prepare himself like the runner to other contestants in the race. All his attention was riveted on reaching the finish line. And so when we think about the Olympic Games, it models the Greek races. Back then, today we get medals for, for Olympics, winning Olympics, but back then in Paul days, uh, they get like a, a, a palm branch or a, a wreath of leaves by the official. They give that to them as the prize. Right? Paul's official is God. Instead of the man putting the gold medal around the, the Olympic, the, the uh, what do you say, the, the, somebody help me out with the, with the person they call it. Olympian. Olympian, thank you, good. They put the, put the gold medal around the Olympian. God is the official. He is looking for God to give him his prize for the hard work, obedience, and endurance that he puts forth. And that prize is heaven. Hearing, good job, my good and faithful servant. That is the prize. That is the ultimate reward for all of us. And so Paul is showing us what that looks like on earth. Right? He was telling the Philippians this, but now we can also grab this too. All right, any comments about that? Walking onward, Paul urged the Philippians to, to have the same mind as he did. If they were to think like that, God will reveal it to them also. So if we, if we have a mediocre attitude or a, a, just a get by mentality, uh, we're, we're not listening to God. We have to have an attitude where we like a mindset that Paul had. That look, I don't care what's in my way. Um, that is the prize. That's where I'm going. God is where it is. He's game changing. Every time we gonna get there, right? We gonna get there. So the Christian life is one in the routine of faithful obedience to God. Steady progress over time is the key to eventful victory. Any questions, comments, concerns about striving with exertion? Because when we have a purpose, sometimes when we're doing things that we love, it don't seem like work. When it's a purpose, when it's purposeful, it don't seem like work. And you put more energy into that, that thing. That's that striving with exertion. That's what that looks like. All right? Striving for, striving in expectation. Here's the last thing. Verses 17 through 21. And I'm going to read all of them again for the sake of time. Oh, that's, a, that's actually quite a lengthy verse. 17, uh, following a good pattern. Uh, brethren, join in following my example and note those who, walk, who so walk as you have us for a pattern. All he's saying there, Paul is saying that, hey, those flock, those have a good power, follow them. Okay? Don't follow those guys with the get by mentality or have a mediocre attitude. Don't follow them because that's considered, that's considered a bad pattern. They forsake those guys. Matter of fact, just to just to go over all of this, to tie those two together, uh, the, the Hebrews or the Jews were there were some Jews that were still living by the law. So that's what Paul was telling them. Look, don't follow that. Follow me. Right? Follow me as I follow Christ. Because I'm showing you that the law really is not what we need to be living by. Because of grace. Because Christ died. Now we're justified when we place our faith in Jesus. Now we follow Christ. That's where we go. We don't need the law right now because we got grace. And so, guess what Paul is telling? Them? That is a bad pattern. Following the 
the rituals, the dietary regulations, the circumcision, and other ordinances of the law. They live lives of physical gratification and self-centeredness, centeredness. Okay, that's what that looks like at birth, and we can see that today. Right? Today, it looks like placing more emphasis on earthly matters than heavenly things. Right? So, heaven is our goal. Christ is our goal. So, we should be following a good pattern, which is verse seventeen and verse. 18 to 19 is forsaken a bad habit, bad pattern, which is we don't live according to what the law uh, of the Jewish law. Okay? But we got to focus on the best. In verses 20 and 21, for our citizenship is in heaven. Our citizenship is in heaven. For which we also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Paul challenged them to center their attention on Christ. He also reminds them that they have a dual citizenship. Yes, you live on earth, but then also in Christ. You're a new creature, you belong to Christ. You know, heaven is your new home now. He did not want them or their earthly experience to overwhelm their heavenly citizenship. So as humans, it is tempted to seek the path of least resistance. Right? Paul challenged them to not look for the easy way, but to strive for God's best way, which is also challenging for all of us. So. To conclude the lesson this morning, the picture shows we must strive forward on the road. We keep moving forward for us, but also at the same time, we want to go up. Okay? So we keep moving forward, press forward, and up. So up, I think it's onward and upward. That's the focus for us. Paul has encouraged the Philippians to. Follow his example, press on, and fully anticipate Jesus' return. We are to focus on the returning king and his kingdom, not on this world and its lesser kingdoms. That's what the takeaway of today's lesson is. Any questions, comments, I'll let that ask you. Questions, comments, concerns of today's lesson about... Counting all things lost. No. Wait a minute. <laughs> well, thank you for your time this morning. I thank God for, for y'all showing up today and, and, and hearing God's word being taught this morning. I'll just close. Any, any, any announcements before we close? We need to make before we close. Okay. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time. Thank you for showing up today, God. Thank you for bringing your people here safely. And God, as we uh, leave this place with natural presence and uh, enter into the next phase of service, God, bless our hearts, Lord oh God, through song, through uh, written word, through preach word today, God. And we just thank you for everything you have done for us, Lord. We give you the glory for Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.